the gods, worship them by all means. But if you had only Lord Guan and the Goddess of Mercy and no peasant association, could you have overthrown the local tyrants and evil gentry? The gods and goddesses are indeed miserable objects. You have worshipped them for centuries, and they have not overthrown a single one of the local tyrants or evil gentry for you. Now you want to have your introduced. Let me ask you how you'll go about it. Will you believe in the gods or in the peasant association? In the early 1920s, when I entered into the United Front with the Guomindang, the Chinese Communist Party was a party composed primarily of intellectuals and focused on China's small, urban proletariat. It had fewer than 1,000 members, and while they knew China's massive peasant population couldn't be ignored if they wanted to build a revolutionary movement, party orthodoxy saw little hope or point in trying to organize them. Peasants were seen as ignorant, provincial, and only interested in their own short-term well-being. It wasn't until a relatively new party member stumbled into the peasant movement that the party would begin to reevaluate the importance of the peasantry. No, not Mao. He was still engaged in union organizing in Hunan at the time. But someone who had little reason to be interested in the struggles of working people at all. Peng Pai grew up in a wealthy landlord family in Haifeng County, Guangdong. So wealthy that the family's land contained over 1,500 tenants, and they were in personal terms with the province's governor, Chen Zhongming. Despite this, Peng Pai was rebellious from a young age, protesting against the local warlord while still in high school. He claimed he had inherited his beliefs from his mother, who was from a poor family and had been purchased as a concubine by his father. In 1917, Chen Zhongming gave Peng funding to get an education in Japan. While there, he got an early introduction into rural politics when he joined the League of Reconstruction Societies, an agrarian reform movement involved in Japan's 1918 rice riots. This experience convinced him to join up with the Chinese Communist Party on his return to China in 1921. Peng's first work for the CCP was in education reform. He was disappointed very quickly. His time as a teacher convinced him that it was impossible to fix the education system from within. Since no matter how radical his teaching was, the students in his classes were always the children of rich families only interested in social climbing. When he tried to radicalize the students by holding a May Day parade, people complained to the governor that he was trying to communize property and women, and Peng was fired. Shortly afterward, in 1922, Peng's family discovered an article he had written calling the people to seize landlord's property, and after a fight, they stopped talking to him. Dismayed and disoriented, Peng Pai left home the next day, looking for some way to help people. According to his memoirs, he eventually wandered into the nearby village of Red Hills, and began talking to random people, using simple language and pretending he was just trying to make friends. The villagers refused to talk to him. They assumed he was collecting taxes. Peng returned home, and wrote a giant zero in his diary. But he was committed to trying again. The next day, he returned to Red Hills. This time, he spoke in flowery, honorific language, hoping to show the farmers that finally somebody considered them important. And he assured them that he wasn't there to take their money, but to help them get theirs back. To which one of the locals replied, We get the hell beat out of us when we're a peck short in our rent. How do you expect us to grab back what you say is ours? Another zero. On his third attempt, Peng tried a totally different strategy. Rather than return to Red Hills, he positioned himself at an important crossroads outside town. When people stopped to rest, he approached and jumped right into his arguments, speaking quickly and directly about specific landlord injustices, and pointing out ways mutual solidarity could be used to fight back. Only a few people, people talked to him at first, but those who did drew in other travelers as they arrived, and soon Peng was lecturing to a crowd of 40 to 50. Peng continued lecturing at the crossroads all summer, and about a dozen people started coming back to listen to him regularly. Peng recollected that he knew he'd been successful one day, when a heckler called out, Stop shooting off your mouth with this nonsense about rent reduction. If you Pungs can just get your own company to stop demanding back rents from me, I might begin to believe you are real. Only for one of Peng's regulars to respond, You may be tilling their land and would benefit from, redu from their reducing rents, but I'm not. What am I to do? Our problem is not to solve our grievances with individuals, but to find our own solidarity. 
After that day's lecture, Pung spoke with the villager who had supported him and his friends. They agreed to give Pung an introduction at Red Hills, so people would be more willing to listen, and they gave advice on connecting to the peasants. Pung's talks in the village reached a much larger audience. He used a question-and-answer style, so it would feel less like a lecture, and eventually incorporated a puppet show, a phonograph, and even a magic show to keep people listening. After his talks, Pung encouraged people to talk to him, to join an agricultural association. But even though the lectures were popular, listeners were reluctant to join. After everyone else has joined, then I will come in, was a common response. Pung found that villagers were most worried about the landlord reprisals, and that promising not to record anybody's membership helped, but it still took over a month to get over 30 members. The first target of the association was a practice of tenant replacement, where landlords would remove lifelong tenants for trivial reasons to charge newer tenants a higher rent, something totally unfamiliar to renters today. Association members promised not to move on to land without the permission of any other member, and any member whose land was taken would qualify for welfare payments from the association. This was a good show of the associ association's capabilities, and it helped the people who had joined, but it had little leverage over non-members who wanted to move on to the new land. The association's next move was more direct. Wharf masters in Haifung County made a profit by charging exorbitant fees for farmers to move their goods. The association turned the tables on the wharf masters by charging them fees to enter association members' villages. That money was then used to pay back the farmers. This campaign was much more widely successful, since it provided immediate benefits to everyone. Peasants began turning to the association to arbitrate disputes and criminal cases, and began instituting smaller, more permanent institutions, such as funeral insurance and a farmer's pharmacy. By the time of the first countywide congress of the Agricultural Association in January 1923, every district in Haifung County had its own organization, with a combined membership of around 20,000. Over the meeting hall flew the symbol of the Haifung Peasant Movement, a checkerboard flag with red and black panels, symbolizing the unity of feudal lineages and the ancient spirit of struggle of the county. The association's first real challenge came in 1923, when the landlord, Zhu Mo, drastically increased rents. One tenant refused to pay. After he was threatened by rent collectors, the tenant appealed to the association for help. Peng Pai convinced five more of Zhu Mo's tenants to, to leave his land and refuse to pay, and Zhu took them to court. The peasants were saved not by mutual solidarity, but by Peng's personal privilege. It turned out that the judge hearing the case was an old classmate of Peng's, so he dismissed it as a favor. Zhu felt insulted and betrayed, and responded by convening a meeting of 500 Haifeng landlords. We landlords have bought our land with good money! We've paid our taxes to the government, and now these criminals from the Peasant Association, who are demanding our land and wives, have begun to buy the courts and use them to mistreat landowners. If this local vandal Peng Pai is not quickly put in his place, our industry will suffer great losses. The landlords put together $100,000 to bribe the judge, who quickly reversed his decision and had the tenants arrested. Now Peng realized the necessity of a popular movement. The next morning, 6,000 peasants rallied in front of the judge's house, demanding freedom for the tenants, an official apology, and a marching band and firecrackers to welcome them back home. The judge, being entirely spineless, immediately gave in and the tenants were freed. Never before had the peasants seen officials and landlords cowed. They were amazed at their own power, and the association membership rose to three to, three to four hundred new members a day. And then, in August 1923, a massive typhoon hit Haifeng. Nearly a thousand were killed, and farmland across the county was flooded. Traditionally, in times of disaster, peasants would appeal to their landlords for rent reductions, and they would agree to take a smaller percentage of the crop. But now the landlord saw a chance to get back at the peasants for daring to challenge their authority. Very few agreed to get to give any rent reductions. The leaders of the association were divided. Originally, they debated whether this was a great opportunity to fight for rent reductions generally, or just to target the worst landlords. But eventually, this more conservative faction was pushed out, and the debate ended up being between campaigning for rent reduction or rent abolition. Peng Pai negotiated a compromise. The association would campaign for a maximum rent of 30%, but with a standing promise to support any peasant who outright, outright refused to pay. The policy had a great start, with most landlords being cowed into submission. 
but one magistrate was dedicated to fighting back. He hired a small squad of soldiers to support his tax collector, and when peasants in one village refused to pay, some were shot, and the village elders arrested. Pung organized a rally in the magistrate's town, but the magistrate went into hiding. Then, when the peasants left, the magistrate sent his soldiers to follow the, the leadership. Early the next morning, the troops fired into the association headquarters. Pung and some others escaped through the roof, but 25 leaders were arrested. Suddenly, the association was forced underground. Pung wanted to organize a mass uprising to fight back, but the other leaders were more, were more cautious. And they knew that Pung's family had connections with the governor. So after much debate, they finally convinced Pung Pai to go to Chen Zhongming for help. Pung spent months negotiating with Chen, who kept insisting that he supported the association and wanted to help, but there just wasn't anything he could do. All the while, the remnants of the association in Haifeng deteriorated under increasing landlord pressure. Finally, in March 1924, Peng gave up. He left Haifeng County and retreated to Guangzhou, where the Communist Party was establishing itself after the formation of the United Front with the Guomindang. Coincidentally, shortly before he arrived, the Guomindang had issued its first declaration of the peasant movement, and it was looking for someone to lead the party's new peasant department. The CCP pointed out that Peng had more experience working with peasants than any anybody else in the city, and he got the job. The Guomindang Peasant Department became synonymous with its first major program, the Peasant Movement Training Institute, designed to teach new activists how to form new peasant associations similar to Peng's in Haifeng. Although the institute was a GMD operation, it was entirely run by communists. In fact, the CCP didn't even establish its own peasant, peasant department until 1926, because communists interested in the rural movement were directed towards Peng Pai. In fact, when the CCP tried to recruit some non-communists into the institute for the sake of appearances, they failed. No Guomindang members had any experience with or interest in the peasants. Classes at the institute focused on the theory and practice of organizing, as well as military training. One lesson Peng took away from the failure of the Haifeng Association was that the establishment of a peasant self-defense force must be a priority to prevent landlord counterattacks, and to train a peasant militia, cadre first had to learn to be soldiers themselves. Peng put a strong emphasis on practical training. Whenever there was a demonstration or strike in Guangzhou, the students would be sent to learn from its organizers. Peng took the students to Guangzhou's suburban villages to form peasant associations there, where the Guomindang army could protect activists from reactionary retaliation, and later classes were able to visit these successful associations to learn from them. Theoretical classes at the institute emphasized topics that would be directly useful to rural organizing, such as statistics, the theory of the peasant movement, the history of secret societies, agricultural development, and singing. Classes lasted one year, and consisted of about 200 students who were then sent back to their home counties to put what they'd learned into practice. Local ties were considered essential for getting a foothold in the villages, so students were selected in part based on what, which counties in the peasant department plan on targeting. Recruitment was difficult, because a large part of organizing is bureaucratic, so students had to be literate, but at the same time they were, had to be willing to leave the cities and engage in hard work. Applicants were required to fill out a questionnaire to determine their, their backgrounds, consisting of questions like, were you in the 1911 revolution? Can you prove it? How do you get along with your family? Is your family powerful? What dialect do you speak? In the first year, students had to be between 18 and 35 with an education, be able to supply their own clothes and bedding, and be free of tuberculosis and able to walk long distances. After the second year, the education requirements were dropped to encourage more workers and peasants to join, but it was still largely a student-based organization. The low number of students was the Institute's greatest, greatest limitation especially since about a third of the graduates remained at the school to teach future classes. Classes were also constantly disrupted by the various emergencies that kept breaking out in Guangzhou. See my previous videos for, for more about those. And when graduates did go out to organize, many were murdered by bandits or militia hired by landlords. Nonetheless, by 1925, peasant associations were a common feature throughout Guangdong province, and the peasant department reported 172,000 members in total. The association system was built from the ground up. Once three village associations were formed, 
they would form a district association, three district associations, a county association, and so on. At each level, decisions were made at Congresses. In this way, the CCP was able to keep the peasant associations completely outside of Guomindang control. However, it also largely kept it independent of CCP control, which combined with the sporadic and often overly enthusiastic reporting at the Congresses, made it very difficult for the Congresses to enact real strategies on the basis of real information. The Training Institute developed between 1923 and 1926, establishing peasant associations throughout Guangdong. While Peng Pai remained a guiding figure within the, the association, leadership developed into a rotating position. In 1925, police in Hunan cracked down on Mao Zedong's organizing team there, and he was forced to flee to Guangzhou, where he joined the institute. And in 1926, Mao became its final leader. As the Guomindang moved to reunify China, a symbiotic relationship developed between its National Revolutionary Army and the peasant associations. In June 1926, Zhang Jishu had consolidated control over the Guomindang, and built up his forces enough to begin the long-awaited invasion of the north. There were three major warlords who were targets of this expedition. Wu Peifu, who controlled Hubei and Hunan, Sun Chunfeng's alliance of five provinces in the lower Yangtze, and the Fengqian clique of Zhang Zuolin, which controlled the northeast and Beijing. Wu and Zhang were busy fighting Zhang Jishe's ally, Feng Yushang, in the northwest, but nonetheless had a huge advantage over the Guomindang on paper. Wu, Sun, and Zhang all had armies of over 200,000 men. The National Revolutionary Army of the Guomindang had about 65,000 troops, but the Guomindang had two secret weapons. One was cash. Zhang Jishe tried bribing every army that confronted him, and these silver bullets led to so many defections that by the end of the campaign, the once sleek and efficient NRA was bloated and had huge supply issues. But the other was the peasant associations. Peasants provided vital logistical and intelligence support to the Guomindang armies. In return, when the army passed through a province, it gave peasant activists protection from landlord retaliation so they could form new associations. As the army moved north, the peasant movement went with it in a great wave. Membership skyrocketed to 1.3 million by November 1926, then 4.5 million by June 1927. Throughout China's countryside, farmers rejected landlord power and formed their own governmental structures. Communist control of the movement had always been tenuous, but now it was almost completely broken, as more and more villages were inspired to form associations just from seeing their neighbors do it despite having never seen a communist. This wave of radical fervor reached the larger towns too, as students latched onto the Northern Expedition as an anti-imperialist revolution. After Hunan was captured, local activists established a general labor union of 400,000 members. The first major city to fall to the Guomindang was Wuhan. The party leadership had tried to focus the anti-imperialist movement on Britain specifically, because they were concerned that Japan might intervene if it was directly threatened. In Wuhan, this led to a massive anti-British strike and boycott as soon as the NRA took the city. The Guomindang told the British government that the only way they could guarantee the safety of the British people in Wuhan was if Britain agreed to return their settlement in the city to the Chinese. And the British actually gave in and surrendered the territory, and then sent a cruiser squadron and an army division to defend the much more important concession at Shanghai. The peasant movement was also at the forefront of a major contradiction within the Guomindang, and would play a vital role in the fracture of the party. In December 1926, the Guomindang government traveled from Guangzhou to Wuhan to establish a temporary capital closer to the action. Meanwhile, Zhang Jishe established his military headquarters in Nanchang. With Zhang's supporters with him in Nanchang, the remainder, the remainder of the government in Wuhan was composed mainly of members of the Guomindang left wing, with Mikhail Borodin as the highest ranking leader. Differences between the two groups arose out of, out of a simple strategic question. The government in Wuhan wanted to continue north to help their ally Feng Yushang and gain better access to the Soviet Union, which would send more aid. The military in Nanchang wanted to turn east to take the prestigious Net Nanjing and the very wealthy Shanghai. Once this argument began, Zhang's right-wing allies took the opportunity to bring up their other grievances. This rabid anti-imperialism was going too far! Britain might throw its full support behind Zhang Zuolin! 
And most importantly, the ex excesses of the peasant movement were depressing commerce! The Guomindang's generals had put up with, and even sometimes approved of, the peasant movement as it helped their army move northwards. But in the end, almost all of these generals came from wealthy landlord families, and they were threatened ideologically at the idea of peasants rejecting the natural order that placed the generals at the top, and they were threatened materially as they worried that their own lands might be confiscated while they were away. Zhang was lobbied on all sides to either split, split with the left Guomindang or excise the communist influence over it. As emissaries were sent back and forth, eventually Zhang asked the ministers in Wuhan to move to Nanchang to establish a, establish a unified government there. Wuhan refused, and both sides called their own plenary sessions of the Central Executive Council to resolve their differences. The government in Wuhan called Wang Jingwei back from his illness to restore his role as leader, leader and the Nanchang headquarters petitioned the Comintern to recall Borodin. The Communist Party leaders in Wuhan were in a very precarious position. They had to show their strength to resist the right-wing GMD, but they also had to placate the left GMD to keep the alliance together. And the peasant movement was the most debated issue. Within the CCP, a debate broke out between Chen Dushou, the leader of the party, who wanted to restrain the peasant movement and ease off the revolutionary rhetoric to keep the Guomindang happy, and a faction led by the famous Marxist theorist Chu Chiobai, which wanted to infiltrate and seize control of the Guomindang in Wuhan. A third position was put forward by Mao Zedong when he submitted his Report on the Peasant Movement in Hunan to the Party Congress. Mao's report was based on a month spent visiting the villages where the uprisings were taking place. He was amazed, and instantly went over to the idea that the Peasant Revolution was the real story in China, writing, If your revolutionary viewpoint is firm, and you have been to the villages to look around, you will undoubtedly feel thrilled as never before. He saw peasants taking control of, of, of food distribution to control rice prices, people's schools being established, and people's tribunals working to get peasant justice for the first time in their lives. And he predicted that the peasant movement would continue, and become the main force of the revolution. In a very short time, in China's central, southern, and northern provinces, several hundred million peasants will rise like a mighty storm, like a hurricane, a force so swift and violent that no power, however great, will be able to hold it back. They will smash the trammels that bind them, and rush forward along the road to liberation. They will send all the imperialists, warlords, corrupt officials, local bullies, and bad gentry to their graves. All revolutionary parties and all revolutionary comrades will stand before them to be tested, to be accepted or rejected as they decide, to march at their head and lead them, to stand behind them gesticulating and criticizing them, or to stand opposite and oppose them. Every Chinese is forced to choose among the three, but by the force of circumstance, you are fated to make the choice quickly. Mao targeted those like Chen Zhou, who claimed to support the peasant movement, but tried to limit it and criticize its violence and excesses. A revolution is not like inviting people to dinner, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so benign, upright, courteous, temperate, and complacent. A revolution is an uprising, an act of violence whereby one class overthrows the power of another. But the Fifth Party Congress rejected Mao's report. His position was hardly even acknowledged in the debate between Chun and Chu Chu Bai, and the Congress adopted a, a compromise position, where seizure and re redistribution of land was approved on principle, but only for big landlords, with over, over 500 mo of land, and who were not related to any officers in the army. In Hunan, this meant almost nobody. Mao claimed illness and refused to attend the rest of the Congress, and less than two weeks later, the entire compromise was shown to be worthless, as the last vestiges of the communist Guomindang United Front came crumbling down. Ah,